Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, before we get started, can you just introduce yourself to us and tell, your, tell us a little bit about you and why you're so interested in this project? Sure thing. My name is Lisa Herrick and I live here in Fresno where I helped my husband found Lit Hop Literary Festival and have worked here in media and broadcasting for a few years as well. Prior to that, I was from the Bay Area where I was a journalist for many years. And um, one of the many things I've encountered through my professional and personal career is just where do women fit in and how can we carve out our space? We talk a lot about work and life balance, but sometimes that seems more theoretical and the real life applications, there's definitely a lot more gray area. And I like this project because I think it's important to talk about what does power look like for women? Is it a universal concept or does it change? Is it different for each person and how is it different? I'd like to contribute my viewpoint to that. So that leads us to what, what are your viewpoints? What does power mean to you? Um, you know, how do you envision um, having power? What, what does that look like? So I think that growing up in America, when you think about power, you usually instantly see images of men, men in power, men of power, uh, institutions, men of learning. But where are the women? Um, I think that in the last 50 years, especially with the civil rights movement, we have seen more public um you know, images of women who advocate for themselves, advocate for the communities. But the truth is, women have always been um, available to have a seat in power. Women have always tried to demonstrate their own power. It's just that it's been difficult to really raise those voices to the forefront. So for me, having power is having a voice. It means really understanding that when you have the freedom to choose, you take that freedom and you make a choice. It also means taking responsibility for your choices. So if you fail, you fail. If you succeed, you succeed, but it's completely yours. And that in itself gives you the power to choose your own life. So how do you claim this power? Um, because that, so that sounds great. And I think everyone would, would wish to do that. But do you feel that there are any, um, any differences in, in how women might go about this? versus how a man might be able to do this. Right. I think that there are difficulties with understanding how to approach power and how it applies to gender as well as race, class, um, you know, your citizenship status. The problem is a lot of those ideas are social constructs. So for what I mean by that is, you know, um, there's a joke that says, you know, you can ask a frog what day it is. <laughs> the frog's just going to look at you and say, what's a day? What's a month? What's a year? I, I don't know what that is. And in the same way, I think that when you talk about power um, to different people, you have to also consider their cultural expectations, their, their paradigms. So, for example, I would not expect um, a woman from a third world nation to have the same aspirations and the same concept of what is a woman as I do in a first world nation. But how I have approached power in my own, you know, uh, personal experience is just education. Education has always been the number one route to understanding, interpreting, comprehending, and accessing power. That does not necessarily mean that um, you achieve you know, economic and commercial success, that you become a senator. But more than anything, it, it just means that you understand where you are and how you fit in society and how you can move in society, that you're not just standing still passively while things happen to you. Education is a great way to open your eyes and help you understand and analyze your experience and how you can choose to change your experience and, you know, who you need to collaborate with. I think that that's one of the greatest you know, ways to demonstrate power is to collaborate and work with other people because you can't work in a vacuum. Um, people who try to isolate themselves with an idea of power, you know, historically we've called those people tyrants. 
and tyrants don't get too far. So kind of linked to that previous question, what have your personal experiences of power been? Uh, like for instance, do you feel that being a woman and, and also, um, as we've talked about, a, a child of immigrants, um, has that caused you to experience power differently in your life? In, Absolutely. In- well, my, my parents are refugees. They were political refugees who came to America through the lottery system in the 1970s and 1980s. And so my very first inkling of power was actually through the lens of a child seeing it being inflicted upon my parents. In in fact, a sense of powerlessness where um, we had to learn a litany of acronyms for government organizations and government social programs to, to literally ask for different ways just to live. And, and that really demonstrated to me that we did not have the resources on our own. We did not have the power to dictate our own lives. We actually depended on many, many people. But the goal was always to be our own and to stand our own feet. But I think growing up as a child of immigrants, you start to learn through you know racist taunts at school or in public. You learn through the media that there are parts of you that are just inferior. And what that does is it really removes your sense of self. It removes your your sense that you can control who you are, that how people perceive you. And ultimately, it strips you of your personal power. I felt this way growing up in the 80s, especially because, you know, this was the age of uh, long duck dong. So there were many times when I had to fight and um, defend my brother at school because he would get taunted and um, just because he was Asian. Or, you know, I would have kids coming up to me and pulling up their eyes and, you know, seeing Ching Chong. And being a child of immigrants who are from Laos and Thailand, I completely skipped that part of the U.S. history. We had no idea about the Chinese Exclusion Act. We didn't even know who Chinese people were. So when someone you know, saying Ching Chong to me, it was really confusing. I did not know what that meant. And I didn't know what it meant until later on in high school. So again, after I learned in school what that meant, why it was why it was so offensive and why it was directed at me, even though I had nothing to do with that, that sense of education and understanding, interpreting that experience, even though it happened in the past and learning that I can change that perception. I don't have to take that. I can say, that's racist. Don't do that. That gave me back my power. And later on in life, when I went to work as a journalist for an English language Asian American news magazine, that gave me even a greater sense of power because now I could say, you don't have to take that. You know, other people are paying attention too. So would you say that that kind of becoming more, but obviously education has, has been a key to it. Um, but just being able to refer to, um, to a past and see yourself as kind of implicated in that somehow, Mm -hmm. is there a certain power that's, that's almost derived from that in some ways that you being able to say, you know, I'm, I'm an individual, Mm -hmm. but I'm also, I also belong to this group. Right. That's important. Right. Well, from an academic standpoint, you know, humans are extremely social animals. Mm-hmm. We have tribes. And your tribe is not necessarily the, the people that you were born with or the people who look like you. You can choose your own tribe. I mean, take sports, for example, you know, Ray Your Nation, right? Mm-hmm. That is a tribe. There is a sense of loyalty, a sense of camaraderie, a sense of compassion, empathy, and forgiveness. But tribes are also, you know, they have a dark side. The dark side is that loyalty can turn into competition. It can turn into violence. It could turn into a us versus them mentality, which in the end, you know, if you look at some of the uh, news headlines about rivalries around the world, a lot of us just shrug and say, I don't see any difference between either of you. I don't get it. In my experience, I think that <clears throat> creating a sense of community is important, but really decreasing 
the mentality of tribalism, of I'm right, you're wrong, and that's that. That is more important. I think that a sense of power comes in the ability to say, I think this, but to also have someone say, I disagree, and to have the opportunity to examine yourself. I think that the people who fight the hardest for their stance, who are the least able to listen or compromise, usually feel that they don't have a sense of power, that this is their last stand, that they have nothing else to fight for. And if they're wrong, they've lost it all. I, I think that that's the worst place to be because I've been in that place before as a child. I remember feeling like, you know, I knew everything. And then, of course, when the truth came out that I did not know that as much as I thought I did, the, the desire to defend myself was strong. But I think power allows you to see that you can still be a leader and still be wrong, but own up to you, your failures and move on, move forward, progress, evolve, and you become even more powerful with that because you set an example for other people. I think that, you know, in many cases, when you're a person of color, a woman, you're not expected to do as much. And so for some people, they accept that. And for me, no. <laughs> I, I know who I am. And I know that having a sense of self, a sense of power means I can determine for myself who I am. So at this point in your life, you seem very self-assured, very, very secure in, in your power as an in individual. Um, but were there any, any turning points in discovering or claiming that power? Um, I, I wonder if you could maybe describe some of your experiences that, that were really formative. Absolutely. So, um, you know, growing up, my parents didn't speak English. Um, my father had actually been a, um, a star student at the university in Vientiane. So he spoke French, and my mother only spoke Hmong. So growing up, um, a lot of the ideas about who a person is, um, where they belong, were done largely in the schema of Southeast Asian folklore, um, Hmong traditional gender roles, and French stories. So. Growing up, I just felt that um, I was taught that basically uh, a woman begins at the age of 14 because it was traditional for a young girl to get married as soon as she had her first period. And so a mother's role in taking care of her daughter and instructing her daughter was simply on how to take care of her husband, including embroidery, feeding children, caring for children. And I distinctly remember being five years old and getting into a huge, ugly argument with my mother because uh, she wanted me to stay up late one night after kindergarten and um, watch her sew and learn how to sew. And I remember telling her, um, well, any husband who, who only wants me because I can sew is not worth my time. And I remember her <laughs> saying, well, then you're never going to get a husband. And I just snapped back, I'm going to be my own husband. And my mother was just completely perplexed by that idea. And I, I think in that one statement alone, it, it really showed the true difference between the two of us as both, you know, as women, but as, as well as mother and daughter. Um, I was already continents away from her idea of who and what a woman is. And also her childhood was just completely foreign to me. So it was difficult for me to relate to her. And um, one day I remember stumbling into the school library and I found uh, this huge, gorgeous book. And I think that for anyone who loves books, they immediately know this book. It was Dolaire's book of Greek myths. With a, it was a giant poster-sized book with a beautiful cover um, of uh, Helios in a chariot being pulled across the sky. And I just remember thinking, what, what kind of culture comes up with these ridiculous stories. I mean, where, where are these people? What, what happened to them? Because these stories are amazing. But more than anything, after reading that book um, and, and encountering goddesses with power, goddesses like Athena and Venus, um, you know, discovering who the Manids were, 
the cult of Dionysus, uh, Atalanta, Amazons. I was like, wow, like women can be warriors. They, they can have their own power. They can be goddesses. They can inhabit heaven and inhabit a world and, and just be complete on their own. They don't need to be in service to something else. I mean, that was mind blowing for me. And so I devoured that book. I, I read that book at least once a month. I memorized every <laughs> single story, not because I found them, you know, fascinating, you know, from a creative standpoint, but because I understood that intuitively they were, they were moral codes of conduct. Um, you know, I think folk tales and fairy tales, especially for civilizations where the majority of the population were working and illiterate, you had to have stories to instruct what is morality, what are ethics, what is nature, and what is divine. Because if you can't learn that from a specific person, then you have to learn it from a story. And what I really, you know, divined from all those myths was that women have power on par with men. And it's different. It doesn't have to be exactly like a man's sense of power. You don't have to be the biggest, the strongest, the fastest, or the smartest, but you can still outwit the hero. You can still cheat death. You can still be single like Atalanta and devise a test to make sure that you never get trapped by the rules of society that come out to make sure that you're subservient and submissive. And that's fine. And that people only get punished when they go against nature. They go against what is natural. And what is natural is what is best for people. So I find it funny that now we have these debates about homosexuality, about religion, about um, people with mental illnesses being unnatural. In the ancient world, those were completely natural. It was a part of life. People disagree. People have different gods. They respect their gods, and you have to respect their gods too. You don't have to worship them, but you have to respect that people have different ideas of how the world works. You know, people with mental illnesses are just a fact. You have to accept that they are part of your community. They are not there to be removed and contained. And women and children, they all have their purpose, and that's not just to be in servitude too, but to empower and to strengthen the community together. I still love that book. I read it every so often just to remind myself that, you know, people figured this all out 5,000 years ago. And we're, still, <laughs> we're still scratching our heads. And I think maybe, maybe if everyone had to read that book, we might have fewer questions about what is, what is existence. Mm -hmm. So how do you think these understandings of power that you've just described influence uh, some of the work that you do, maybe some of the projects that you're involved in? Sure. So currently I, uh, I serve on the advisory committee for the Better Blackstone Association's What's Cooking Fresno. Um, it's an incubator program, actually. And what we're trying to do is um, recruit emerging food entrepreneurs from underserved communities here in Fresno, uh, in the city limits of Fresno and connect them to resources to basically create a mentorship program and a formal uh, training program. So they're currently taking classes um, and they have access to a commercial kitchen. They can learn the laws and the ins and outs about food prep and how to be a business person. And I think this is an, an essential skill because again, it, it reminds me of growing up and watching my parents struggle and having to ask for help and um, just not getting it. Um, it was difficult to see them go through that. And part of the reason why I love being on this, this board is because I get to do something that helps someone else who's struggling. Um, I get to, you know, help create a way for our city to thrive, to create opportunities for our city to become stronger economically, to help the cultural identity of our city continue on. I think that, you know, that sort of work is, is crucial, but the work I've done with Lit Hop Literary Festival is also very similar. You know, Fresno is the mecca of poets in the poetry circles. But I think that if you asked anyone who lived here, they'd say, really? 
it is. <laughs> and I think that really shows, you know, how, how much we undervalue the people who live here. Um, we wanted to do the Lit Hop Literary Festival because it was a great opportunity to make people understand that we are here and we're strong, we have voices, and we can choose and decide for ourselves how we want to express ourselves. To me, again, that goes back to exactly what is the seat of power. It's the ability to say, I'm here. All right. Well, you've certainly given us a lot to think about. Um, thank you so much again for yes, coming and you. sharing your experiences with us. Thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure and joy. <laughs>